In many places on our planet, men and women have left mysterious traces behind them. These are geoglyphs, designs left on hillsides or the ground, made by the hand of man. Most of these designs have been erased by passing time, but some have passed through history to reach us. It's a miracle that we can still admire some of them. While no one knows the name of their creators, all the geoglyphs are shrouded in mystery and legend. What was it that led people to conceive these enormous shapes and to leave a message in the ground which would last throughout the millennia? We, we know that gods and goddesses were very important uh, way back in the past. Really, making shapes, carving them into the ground, that's not too difficult. On the other hand, planning on such a big scale, that's impressive work. The Nazca civilization, which is mainly known for its lines, didn't just produce that. He's iconic, he's unique, he attracts a lot of interest, and he generates a lot of storytelling. It's an enigmatic shape. No one knows when it dates from or who made it. We can't be sure why, why it was made in the first place. So, so these things are mysterious fundamentally. We will go to England, where many geoglyphs can be found. We will also visit South America, in the Atacama Desert, where different peoples at different moments in history have left these mysterious designs in the ground. Let us begin with the most enigmatic, the Nazca Line. Every year, thousands of tourists cross the Atacama Desert in Peru to come face to face with one of the greatest mysteries of humanity's history. Of all the geoglyphs in the world, the Nazca Lines are certainly the most famous. However, upon arrival, there is just a desert plain to be found, a jumble of stones and dust with nothing at all growing and no sign of any archaeological treasure. Only by getting up onto a platform can a small part of the puzzle here be seen. Two figures are visible, a tree and a hand. As well, there are long straight lines stretching out towards the horizon. But to fully comprehend the beauty of the geoglyphs of Nazca, they must be seen from above. Since the only way to see the lines properly is from a plane, flights are in great demand. Nazca Airport is the second biggest in Peru. The lines can be seen from raised ground, but in my opinion, the clearest view of the lines is surely to see them from a plane. From the sky, you can best see the true shapes of the lines. We came from Korea. Now, after waiting for 45 minutes, we'll be able to see the lines from a plane. I've seen so many reports on this and photos. There's a lot of mystery surrounding this, where it came from, who made it, how they made it. Since no one can explain scientifically what they are, what they mean or why they were made, we've come here ourselves to get an idea of what these lines represent. But a sandstorm rises over the town. All flights are cancelled. Our pilot, Eduardo Herrán, offers to take us as close as possible to the lines. Eduardo isn't just a pilot. He's fascinated by the Nazca lines. Aboard his microlight plane, he has discovered hundreds. He takes us to the edge of town. This is where El Tela, the weaving loom, is to be found. It's one of the rare geoglyphs that can be closely approached. 
and which allows us to understand how these lines were traced. In reality, it's very simple. The stones are pushed to the sides and the centre is swept. This means that a layer which has more white clay and it stands out against the dark surface. This is how the lines were made. It's really not very complicated. Most of the lines could have been made with simple tools, such as stakes of wood and ropes. But their precision proves that the Nazca civilization understood mathematics. Many people, like Eduardo, are convinced that the Nazcas had some way of getting up high so they could check their work. From the ground, they're not easy to make out. And what we can see from here is rather shapeless. But the further up in the sky you are, the easier it is to see what these people were trying to say to us. So, if you ask me whether the ancient people could fly, I would say yes. I think they used kites made from canvas and feathers to look at their work. Another of the mysteries of the Nazca lines is their incredible longevity. They can still be seen after 2,000 years without anyone looking after them. The first reason for that is geographic. The lines are in the most arid desert on the planet, where it never rains and where vegetation is rare. The absence of humidity means there is very little erosion. But sandstorms can also play a part in this. All the surface dust is pulled off, as if the lines were being swept. So, after one of these storms, I like to fly my microlite because it's possible that the winds have made new marks visible. I think the ancient people knew about this effect of the wind and used it as a maintenance system to keep the lines clear. Next morning, the sandstorm has died down. Flights progressively start again at the airport. After a few minutes flying, the great straight lines are the first that we can see. They seem to stretch out for kilometers. Smaller designs can also be seen, some of which represent animals. The monkey, the spider, and the hummingbird are only some of the hundreds of geoglyphs to be found on the plane. Anyone flying over these lines is struck by these questions. Who made this? Why? How can these marks be so precise, so straight? And what was the meaning of these symbols? Why did this tradition of line tracing last over a thousand years? And everyone at Nazca has their own explanation of the line's origin. The straight lines could have been sacred ways where gatherings or sacrifices took place. Other people think the lines were part of a cult of mountain worship. The zaniest explanation comes from a writer coming up with the idea that the lines could have been used as a landing field by extraterrestrials. This hypothesis is reinforced by a mysterious design on a mountainside, which could be an alien or a man with the head of an owl. What we can see here is a model of the plane with the lines. This is only the commercialized part of the area, so to speak, where all the flights are made. Here you can find the monkey, the dog, and the hummingbird. But this just represents 10% of the lines. We're confronted here by a monumental document. To better understand the Nazca lines, we can try to tour around the other geoglyphs on the planet. While the Nazca lines are the most famous, they're not the only geoglyphs. Others are to be found in England, where dozens of what are called hill figures can be found. The 
Wilmington Longman is at least 300 years old. Neither its makers nor the motives for its making are known. The figure was forgotten, then rediscovered one fine day. Up until the 19th century, it had become grown over. And there was a woman living there who noticed one day when it had snowed that the snow was melting to reveal the image of a man, of a figure, just because the snow was melting slightly differently in the channels. And so this figure came out of the snow, and that's how it was discovered. Philip Cargom is a druid. His relationship with the giant began 20 years ago. When one of his friends died, he undertook a pilgrimage on foot, which ended at the Wilmington Long Man. The reason why you have these figures in, the, in this particular part of Britain is because the topsoil is quite thin. And so you have the white chalk, and then you have a thin layer of soil. So it's very easy to cut down with a spade and cut it out, and then you can see the white chalk. At one time, the chalk could no longer be seen. The marks were therefore replaced with cement painted white. Despite these restorations, the Long Man remains a special place for the region's druids. In Druidism, we treat all of the earth as sacred. Uh, and there are also special spots that seem to be especially sacred or very important. And this is one such spot. Eight times a year, our local Druid group has a big festivity here. Eight times a year, the solstices, the equinoxes, and so on. If you were in Wiltshire, if we were in another part of England, we would meet at a stone circle. But here, we don't have a stone circle. Instead, we meet, we meet here. Many legends surround the giant. Is it a lover sitting to mourn the loss of his beloved? A giant wounded by a stone thrown by another giant? Difficult to know who made it and why. But beyond the legends that the design inspires, Philip Cargom thinks that the main thing is the effect it has on people now. And so it's a human figure. And because it's merely the outline, it somehow symbolizes every man, every woman. And onto this very simple image, we can project all our feelings and our thoughts about humanity and what it means to be human. I think it's important to find places for you to go when either something difficult has happened in your life or perhaps you just need time on your own. Life has become a little stressful or difficult. Geoglyphs can still play a spiritual role for mankind. And in Chile, people are fighting to protect this ancient cult. On the Cerro Unitas Hill, an 86-meter-long figure has been contemplating the plain for centuries. The Atacama giant was made before the arrival of the Spanish, between the year 1000 and 1400. The figure is the work of the Aymara people and represents a puma man. The Atacama giant is a very important place for communication with the cosmos. It's a convergence point for positive energy. The Atacama giant isn't the only geoglyph on this hill. There are also mysterious circles, a feline design, and human figures. As at Nazca, the geoglyphs have been drawn simply by moving stones and have lasted through time thanks to the special climate of the desert. The Aymaran culture behind these figures is a people of 22 million spread out over Chile, Peru, Bolivia and Argentina. The Aymaran culture has a deep respect for nature, especially Mother Earth, Pachamama. Javier Vilca is fighting to save and transmit this culture. A long time ago, our ancestors surely made offerings to nature in this place, to bring rain, to demand plenty, to calm the storms, lessen the earthquakes. Surely, because our culture is integrated, convivial and harmonious and respectful of nature. For centuries, there was open access to the giant and it was possible to walk upon the lines. 
but tourism and the irresponsible behavior of some menaced its protection. For some years now, access has been prohibited. We can't go up on the hill. I'd like to go up there and see what's there. At this distance, we can only see that there's something. But what is it? I'd like to see to define that more precisely. There should be what we call a sacred table, a place where you can pray and give offerings. But well, the day will come when we see these places return to the indigenous people, the true heirs of this culture. After the arrival of the Spanish, different political regimes tried to break up the Aymaran culture. Javier Vilca battles daily to transmit the knowledge of that culture to new generations. But it is difficult to communicate and conserve these traditions. It's a different view of the world, which has to be taught anew to the youngest. Our ancestors made their offerings before going fishing to the water god, La Marcota. They went to sea and brought back their catch. Why? Because they had implored their god and the sea for its blessing. The sea is an important source of nutrition. It feeds us. It's something tremendous. And because of that, it must be loved. It must be preserved. Because the sea brings benefits to every one of us. Javier Vilca regrets that the elements which would allow us to decode the geoglyphs have been lost over time. He goes to the Cerro Pintados site, a few kilometers away from the Atacama giant. Here, the whole side of the mountain is covered with geoglyphs. There was an important route which went from Altiplano to the sea and passed by here. We don't know since when, but we do know it has been here for several thousand years. We can't decode all of this precisely because our wise men, the Samoatas, are no longer with us. They left when the conquistadors arrived. So amongst all the signs that are here, there are only four we can easily recognize and that we still use in our weaving. Like the water king, which is represented by the toad. We can also recognize the marriage symbol, these two little doves, which allow us to see clearly which is the man and which is the woman. Then we have the llama, which is a very important animal, part of life for indigenous Aymaran society. There is also the sign we call La Achacana, which is a symbol we recognize and preserve because it represents the direction of life. Geoglyphs still hold a place in various beliefs. Cults that are still dedicated to them by some people give us an idea of the link there could have been in the past between the geoglyphs and their makers. The cults devoted to the Nazca lines couldn't have been that different to those still existing today in England and Chile. But this knowledge has been lost over time. The Nazca lines were only rediscovered in 1924 when planes began to fly over South America. But after 100 years of research, their exact significance remains an enigma. The explanations given remain for the moment just theories. Like the lines, there are a lot of theories. It was a woman, Maria Reicher, who began to really study the geoglyphs in a scientific fashion. In the 1940s, this enthusiast devoted her life to studying and protecting the site. Without her work and obstination, the lines would probably have been destroyed. After many years of study, Maria Reicher ended up with a theory that the lines are a sort of star calendar and their orientation is linked to the stars. Maria Reicher discovered that some of the lines pointed to the solstice, like those which cross the design of the spider. So, are the Nazca lines an immense calendar drawn on the ground?
several hundred kilometers from there on the Pacific coast, another geoglyph can perhaps help us to understand the mystery of the Nazca lines. The Candelabro de Paracas is now in the heart of a national park. Land access is impossible, and you have to get there by boat, as thousands of tourists do each year. Juan Carlos Heaton, the director of the reserve, takes us to see the famous candelabra. Many research workers have come here. One of them was Maria Reich, who was Peruvian and German. She undertook astronomical and mathematical research on the lines and shapes of Nazca. She tried to make a connection between the symbols and an astronomical calendar for the civilizations that lived here. In that context, this figure is also associated with the Nazca culture. The candelabra has a lot to do with astronomy and the Nazca lines, a theory which other scientists have confirmed. The candelabra has all the qualities of a compass. This could be the Southern Cross seen by day. It has the same direction, with the top of the candelabra showing the south and the base signifying the north. It resembles the Southern Cross exactly, according to Maria Reich. So, this design could serve as a reference for daytime navigation. We could also say that this design functions in the same way as a marker. This simple trace in the ground is actually visible out at sea to a distance of 20 kilometers, but it's impossible to know whether it was made by navigators of antiquity or by 17th century pirates. We don't know its exact date. Scientists can't tell if it is 10,000 or 500 years old. But we do know that the pre-Incan ancestors of Peruvians, as well as the Incas themselves, were very good navigators. The whole coast of Peru and South America was known to the Peruvians of antiquity. The idea that Nazca is an astronomical calendar is attractive, but the great majority of lines don't point to any star or constellation. Since the geoglyphs are often visible from far off, they've often been thought of as a kind of signpost, and not only in the desert. English geoglyphs are mostly white horses. There are nearly 20 across the country. Amongst the oldest is the Uffington White Horse. It must be the first in this long tradition, as it dates from between 1400 and 600 years before our era, towards the end of the Bronze Age. There are several mysteries associated with the White Horse, and there are many theories as to its significance. Harriet Verrid is a historian. She knows the White Horse well, in her opinion, it is above all a geographical marker. We're talking about pre-literate people who had no maps, no, no GPS, no, no navigational equipment. Yeah. This is the Vale of the White Horse. And of course, from down there, you actually get the best view of the White Horse because the White Horse isn't really supposed to be viewed from close. The horse can in fact be seen from the whole valley, it has impressive dimensions, over 100 metres long and 35 metres high. The white chalk stands out so as to make the design visible from afar. Every now and then, let's say every 10 miles, something like that, that would be a day's journey if you've got flocks of animals, for instance. So you would want junctions, you would want signposts saying, this is where you can stop off and, and, and rest and probably pay for it too but you would have to have somewhere for people and animals to stay overnight. So it, it must have been a signpost.
The horse is such a good reference point that it had to be covered up during the Second World War. It was too easy to recognize for enemy aircraft. And there is a second hypothesis about what it represents. Actually, it's probably not a horse. It's probably a dragon. They didn't call it Polaris, they called it Draconis. Draconis meaning dragon. So we think that from a navigational point of view, the dragon was a very important symbol. And this is why we think that it's a dragon rather than a horse. Andy Foley is the site's curator. He knows the legend well and what happened to the dragon with the arrival of Christianity. St. George and the dragon had a fight on here. George won, he killed the dragon, the blood came forth and was so poisonous that it burnt the grass down here and that, that's why we have this mark. Nothing grows there because of the dragon's blood, okay? <laughs> Whether the figure is of a horse or a dragon, its design is striking, very refined and very modern. The horse is, as you say, very, very stylized. It's, as I say, 110 meters long, as if it's always running across these high hills up here that we have. This was done in the, in the Bronze Age or the Iron Age, 800 BC, a long time ago. But the people then were very artistic, very stylistic. So yes, they could, they could draw wonderful things like this. They could make wonderful rings and jewelry, you know. So they're very stylistic, but they could be very barbaric as well, because in the hill fort behind us, we found skeletons with the arms and the legs and the head all chopped off. So they could be beautiful, stylistic, but also barbaric. Geoglyphs are mysterious and have given rise to many legends. But it is always difficult to find the truth amongst the different conflicting theories. While some seem to have been reference points for past travelers, this explanation doesn't fit the Nazca lines, which are hard to see from the ground. However, archaeologists are interested by the special relation of the Nazca civilization with water. One theory links the lines to irrigation. Alex, from the Ministry of Culture, takes us to visit the Cantaloc aqueducts. The ancient Nazca were great hydraulic engineers. They built irrigation channels, one of them being the aqueduct of Cantaloc, which is still in use today. The Nazca civilization was in the middle of the desert. The balance with nature was precarious, and finding water was a daily worry. Droughts and climate variations brought about catastrophes and famines for the population. The Nazca did everything they could so as not to depend on rare rainfalls. Especially, they built complex irrigation systems. Mastering irrigation allowed the Nazca civilization to develop agriculture and to have an impressively large population for such a desert environment. Thanks to this, thousands of people lived around the city. Their wells, still visible, are incredible constructions as much for their design as for their way of working. It has a spiral shape which makes access easier, which is very useful for periodic cleaning, as the villagers have to work to keep the water clear. When the earth moves, as it does in earthquakes, for example, then there are stones that collapse, and there are branches which block the passages. The spiral shape not only means that the underground channels can be maintained, but also means that a lot of people can get into work at the same time. According to the partisans of the water theory, some of the marks on the plain follow the underground network. Others mark out groundwater sites. Cults would move around on these lines calling for rain and leaving offerings to ask for more favorable climate. But 
once again, a recent study shows that most of the signs and marks are not linked to water. While water was vital to the Nazca culture, it was not the main reason for the creation of the lines. It's incredibly complicated to try and explain the geoglyphs. The marks have remained, but the memory of their creators has faded. In the absence of reliable archaeological data, it's difficult to resolve their mysteries. The little village of Cern Abbas in England also has a chalk geoglyph. A giant of 55 meters by 50, representing a naked man armed with a club. To distinguish between different theories, here, an original method was tested. For years, it was thought that this figure dated from prehistory, but 30 years ago, it was realized that there was no indication of its existence before 1694. Yes, the first reference we have to the Cern Giant is in the Church Warden's accounts of 1694, which was discovered by Vivian Vale here actually in Cern Abbas uh, for repairing the giant three shillings. The absence of historical records aroused Catherine's curiosity. She was then working at the University of Bournemouth. Catherine decided to organize a public trial where different specialists could come to defend their opinions about the giant's origins. Two main hypotheses stood out. The figure looks prehistoric, and so it could belong to the Eurotrigian uh, pre-Roman period as, as, as an a, a, a ancient Celtic warrior god waving his, his, his club around. But it has been suggested uh, by one or two authorities that in fact it was uh, cut out on the orders of Denzil Hollis, who was owner of the Cern Estate in the 1640s, 50s, during the English Civil War. And Denzil Hollis uh, started off as being um, very much pro-Oliver Cromwell, who led the revolution against the king. He saw the, the, the slaughter and the, and, the, and, the, and the hatred and the damage and changed sides and decided to be to support the king. When he finally returned home in 1654, he had commissioned, he had cut on the hillside this satirical image of Oliver Cromwell, because Oliver Cromwell was known to his supporters in the form of the, the, the pagan god Hercules the god of great strength. So it, it's, a, it's, it's, in that sense, it's a political lampoon. After the debates, a vote was held to decide on the favourite theory. The score was close between the two theories. While some continue to believe the giant is several thousand years old, the theory of a gigantic satirical drawing seemed credible to many people. In England, this design has passed into posterity for another reason. This is surely because of the impressive size of a certain portion of his anatomy. Well, the giant, of course, is a powerful Im image of, of, of male fertility, of, 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 of male strength. Virility, I think, is the right word. And therefore, we, we have, one does understand that sometimes courting couples or women who have difficulty in conceiving um, come to spend time at the giant. Um, and um, they may be fortunate. <laughs> The Cern Abbas Giant, a powerful image which a lot of adverts have used to sell their brand. There, there, there are a good many of those. Here's, here's another one, here he is. <laughs> As an image, he's, he's, used, he's used quite a lot in all sorts of ways. As I said, he's said to be the only pornographic material which is accepted by the post office, indeed by the tourist authorities. Um, so yes, he's used quite often for this, this kind of context. The giant is a geoglyph with many faces, a satirical and political design, making prayers come true, being an advertising mascot. Is it possible that the Nazca lines also had multiple functions for the region's inhabitants? In the 1980s, a major discovery reshuffled the deck and opened up new perspectives, the citadel of Kawachi. 
What can be seen today is just a tiny part of a vast complex. Soledad from the Archaeological Service takes us there. Excavations at Kawachi began in 1982, but the entire surface was buried. Now we presume that just 5% of the total archaeological complex has been brought to light. So, of course, there's a lot more to dig up and discover. Since they lack the means, archaeologists are advancing very slowly at the site. But its purpose can already be determined. Kawachi isn't a citadel, as was thought when it was discovered. It was a religious center, which had incredible importance in its time. It stretched over 24 square kilometers and welcomed thousands of pilgrims each year. At the time, it was the equivalent of Mecca or the Vatican. There's a relationship between the lines and the citadel. The geoglyphs are found in front of the most important ceremonial centers on the plain. But at the back part of the citadel, we've also found a variety of lines and trapezoids. Geoglyphs which have an important link with Kawachi. The same civilization which built the citadel made the geoglyphs. As for their impressive size, the people here must have considered that their gods could contemplate the geoglyphs. They were offerings to the gods, made so they could see them. People came from very far away on pilgrimage, and thousands of people lived here to welcome the visitors. The key to better understanding of the lines seems to be to better understand the whole of this civilization. But the Nazca did not only leave behind their geoglyphs. The lines are just one of the many means of expression used by this civilization. Giuseppe Orifici is one of the region's principal archaeologists. As we've seen, the Nazca civilization was impressive because it had many forms of expression, ranging from ceramics to geoglyphs, as well as all the other systems of expression. This shows us the grandeur of this civilization, which, based on a theocracy, dominated a very large territory for over a thousand years. The Nazca civilization was very advanced from a technological point of view, not just in irrigation, but also in construction, mathematics, music, agriculture, and pottery. The iconographic themes which are found in the Nazca lines show us that they had a great ability to reproduce scale drawings. This was because they managed to succeed in reproducing using gigantic lines the iconography found on ceramics. With such a rich and varied culture, the diversity and precision of the Nazca design seems a little less astonishing. But despite all these discoveries, the Nazca lines keep most of their secrets, and it has to be accepted that some of them will always remain a mystery. Doubtless in the years to come, sleeping geoglyphs will be discovered, especially thanks to the growing precision of satellite imagery. So they will continue to feed legend and generate stories of the supernatural. But the geoglyphs offer us one last enigma. What do we do with them now? At Nazca, some sites are protected, but there are so many designs spread out over such a vast surface that some have not even been listed. And in Chile, on the flanks of Charros Pintados, the great vulnerability of the geoglyphs is clear. The enormous fresco is pierced with holes that have degraded the geoglyphs. This is because of mining prospecting, looking for saltpeter deposits at the end of the 19th century. Here we can see the traces of those which were degraded and destroyed because people at the time of saltpeter mining didn't have the slightest idea of the value of this giant message. 
They called these places the Painted Mountains, but in reality they're not paintings, and this has nothing to do with the original name of the mountains. This shows their ignorance of the value of the geoglyphs, which are so important. Today, at least the intention is to protect these. Because these ceremonial sites were sacred, they need to be given back that value. As these sites are returned to us, we'll re-establish the great harmony with nature that once existed. But protecting them isn't enough. Most geoglyphs risk disappearing if they are not maintained. On the same site as the Nazcas, an even more ancient civilization had begun to create geoglyphs, the Paracas. These designs had almost disappeared and were very difficult to see, so a restoration campaign was begun. Johnny Isler, director of the archaeological service, comes with his team to restore the precious designs. What we're going to do is take some photographs so that we can get a scale. After that, the piles of stones weren't there originally, so we'll take them away. Practically, that's what we're going to do. At the Palpa site, we've identified nearly 80 groups of figures of this type. They were all disappearing because they had been made on the mountain slopes, where there's a lot of erosion, sometimes rain, people passing by, earth movements, and also dust and wind, which caused erosion. We identified several different groups, such as this one here, which has been restored by putting the stones back in place, which makes the figure more visible. Basically, what we're doing is lifting the stones which have fallen inside the figures and putting them back on the sides so that the figure keeps its original contours and in that way it can be seen from far off. It's a technique which we use for buildings, but with geoglyphs, it's the first time that we've used it to bring them back to their original state. Sometimes we have to clear away the earth that builds up on the stone with brushes and nothing else. And in some cases, when we're restoring them, we use a little water to clean the stones so as to make them more visible. Nothing more. It's a very simple technique, but it takes a lot of time. We clean them carefully, just enough to be able to visualize them without altering them. Maintenance and restoration are also part of daily life around the Uffington White Horse. More than 250,000 people come each year to visit the site and to do all sorts of strange things inspired by the legends. Nice. One is that you, if you stand in the eye of the horse and you spin round three times, it will bring you luck. But if I see you, I will tell you off. It's, it's, not, it's not good. It's, erosion is one of our biggest problems. I mean, all, all this, this is because of people stepping. We, we ask, don't step on the horse, so they step here. And then you multiply this by thousands. This is why you get marks like this, like that. It's where people step every time. That's a step, you see? And that, that's, that's the, the problem. But it keeps me busy. All, there's always work to do here, OK? But there's no question of closing the site. The powers that be want people to have access to the horse and to know its history. 
so the geoglyph has to be maintained every year. 400 people work in relay over two days to renew the surface level of chalk. This is how we chalk the horse. The method hasn't changed in thousands of years. It's exactly the same. This is our technology. We could, if we want, today, the, the men who make the roads, they have the pneumatic. You know, you could, you, yes, you could do that here, but it's not the same, is it? It's not, it's not, the, it's not the story. We want, we want to do it, the, we want to keep tradition alive. That's what it's all about. This is our heritage, the heritage of England, so we want to keep it, we, we want to use people, not machines. The Uffington White Horse has thus been looked after from generation to generation for over 3,000 years. Elsewhere in the country, other geoglyphs have been lost for lack of maintenance and covered back over by vegetation. Today, English hill figures are mainly looked after by institutions or groups of local inhabitants. Some are still made, keeping the tradition alive. The latest was made in 2006 near to the Channel Tunnel entrance. In 1990, Catherine launched a project with her students. In the, uh, in the months following the trial, I thought it would be an interesting uh, thing to do to conduct some uh, exercise in experimental archaeology and to tape out a giantess, a, a hill figure. She is the same. She's, they say, much the same height. Um, she is slimmer. She is a mirrored version of him, quite literally, but, of course, without the, the, um, the, the same accoutrements that the male has, although she's recognisably female. To respect proportions and guide the design, Catherine and her team used a grid. Creating a geoglyph was an intense experience for several hours, which allowed them to put themselves into the shoes of and to better understand the creators of the original work. As we discovered with the giant S, they're not difficult to lay out. This is not a, not a, not a difficult, not an exercise, it is too difficult. It doesn't take long to do. Uh, uh, I'm sure the creator, uh, whoever it was, definitely saw the end result of his work. Yes, of course he did. And, and the people who helped to, to, to dig out the figure. Yes, of course they did. It didn't take long. Designing and creating geoglyphs remains a living tradition. And although it's the artists who practice land art who come closest to the works of our ancestors, we create geoglyphs all over the planet, sometimes without realizing it. Here, it's the grid pattern of streets in a United States ghost town. There, a satellite staging marker in the Chinese Gobi Desert. Geoglyphs might seem to merely be historical curiosities, but they are also the last unique vestiges of some civilizations. Will what we create today also voyage through history? What will this teach those who study us in the thousands of years to come? Will these be the only traces we leave behind us if we vanish?